Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and today you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. I'm here with artist and photographer Nina Fuller, um, who works with the Portland Art Gallery and has created one of these lovely pieces that actually is now mine. So thank you very much for um, being here today and also for making possible this wonderful lamb photograph that is up on my wall. Tell me about, let's start, first of all, welcome. Thank you for having me here. It's beautiful here. And thank you. And I want to talk about these lambs because they really spoke to me when I, I love your work. It's very farm based, which makes sense because you have a farm in Hollis. But in particular, there was something about these lambs that just really it kind of spoke of joy. So these these three lambs, this is one of those photographs that um, w was, uh, obviously they're moving and they were coming out. I mean, a lot of my photographs, it's very still, it's in the barn, it's that light coming through and, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is what I do here. This is perfect. Um, this photograph, there is a space where it's dark in the back where a lot of my photographs are which I also like is the white and then the black, black, black in the back, but they're moving. So it's, oh, it's, oh my gosh, click, 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 click. And then you don't really, um, because they're coming out, which is, happens very fast. And then, so I think, oh, this is going to be great. And a lot of times once it gets onto my computer, it's like, oh, wow, I thought that was going to be really great. <laughs> it's not, but this is one of those pictures that was like, yes, I, I got it. And these three sheep, these three lambs, it, it's a breed of, not the breed that I raise. You know, I raise Scotties. These are Cormel Scotty mix. So if you look at all my work together, you'll see this is an unusual sheep <laughs> lamb compared to the rest of them. But maybe no one notices that. Well, now that you've told me this, I'm kind of interested because I have paid attention to your work. And if I was looking... What would I see? Um, the the other sheep are have horns and black faces, and these clearly do not. No, and even the little lammies um, are born. They're black faces. They're white with black faces, and they have little little. The rams are born with little tiny horns, and the females don't have any horns. That's why you know right away when they're born. It's like, oh, it's a ram. It's, a, but at this age. If they were rams, you'd see little horn, horns, and they would have black faces. Yep. So as I introduced you, I said artist and photographer, but I left out the whole artist, photographer, and I guess farmer. Farmer, yes. Sheep farmer. Which is a big part of what you do as these um, animals end up appearing as subjects in your work. Yes. I mean, I, I, for the last 10 years, I've been photographing sheep. Um, because I have the sheep and I think they're just fascinating. And I, I wonder how, like 10 years from now, will I still be photographing sheep? I don't know. I mean, the whole journey, I've been a photographer for over 50 years, which seems crazy. And, and each part of that time, there was a different thing going on. I mean, most of the time when I was raising my children, um, as a single mom, I was doing commercial work. And, you know, that was that. <laughs> I don't do a lot of that now. <laughs> so, so it paid the bills. It, it definitely it did pay the bills. I, I worked for, I did the um, L.O. Bean catalog. I did the Land's End catalog. I did the um, Dover Saddlery catalog because I photographed horses. Um, before I was, I photographed a lot of horses and I took a lot of, I write and I've written a lot of travel articles to, um, for Boston Globe mostly, but of course the Portland Press Herald and um, other horse magazines. And I started doing that mostly because I wanted to go on horse trips and that was a way to do it, um, you know, without paying a lot of money. <laughs> so that worked. So there's a kind of a practical element to not only um, the work that you've done as a, as a writer and an, as a photographer, but also the work you chose to do in commercial photography. The, well, the, 
the work, you know, the, the um, L.L. Bean catalog and the Land's End catalog and those catalogs also involved a lot of travel, which was fun. So I was really fortunate to be able to do that. You're not originally from Maine. No, I'm originally from New York. So how does someone from New York, and I think you moved here in 1972, is that what I, I'm reading this in Off the Wall from, you know, our art gallery publication from a few years ago, but how does someone from New York end up coming to Maine and then deciding, oh, I think I'd like to have a farm? Um, well, I was born in, in the Bronx um, and lived in Long Island, Queens, till I was eight. And my dad worked in advertising in New York City. He was like, you know, the Mad Men guy. <laughs> so um, we moved, like the guy in Mad Men, we moved up to Westchester when I was eight years old. And we had a farm, but it was like a gentleman's farm. So we had a lot of animals. My mother loved animals. And then, you know, the 60s happened and sort of back to the earth. And I started reading Helen and Scott Nearing and wanted to just escape. So um, I was married, we were very young, and we moved up here in 72 and bought a farm in New Gloucester. And the whole theory was, well, you know, back to the earth, raise all our own food, all our own everything, make our own. I, I mean, we did. I made our own soap, my own everything. And then that dream exploded, and I got divorced and moved into town. And that was 76, um, lost the farm. So it really it took from 76 to 2004 to get back to a farm. <laughs> so I, not that I was trying that whole time, because I was really having a blast doing other things. But I always knew, and I lived in Cape Elizabeth. I raised my kids in Cape Elizabeth. And I, I mean, I always knew in the back of my mind that I would I got to get back to a farm. I got to get back to a farm. So just, you know, I had to do other stuff, get it out of the way. So, and I went back to the farm. Helen and Scott Nearing were known for the good life. And the good the, life. And, and living the good life. Living the good life. Yeah. And, and that was something that drew a lot of people to Maine during that time frame. This idea of going back to the land and really becoming self-sufficient and, and digging in and having access to tangible things. Um, but my understanding is you aren't the only one who had that dream explode because it, the good life is not so easy to obtain, I think, at least not the way that they <laughs> laid it out. I know it was kind of ironic living the good life and it did explode. Um, I think now, I mean, that was, we were a wave, you know, that was a thing you did then, but it wasn't, and the whole organic, Theory, you know, there was a big group of people that were like, oh, it's a bunch of hippies and it's not really real. And I, now, I mean, people know it is, it is real. And now people are able to actually make a living doing it and people are doing it. And the whole farm to table idea and yeah, it took a long time. It took a really long time, so, but it's more accepted now with, it's more mainstream now. I mean, Whole Foods came and, you know, all that, so. So you're just ahead of your time. Yeah. Me and all the other hippies that yeah. did it. <laughs> right. You're, so you're kind of laying the foundation. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's good you were able to come back around and, and make it back out to the farm. It was really good. I mean, I really, Cape Elizabeth, you know, it's nice, but it's Cape Elizabeth. And it just, um, to buy, to have a farm like I have in Cape Elizabeth would have been, I mean, my photography career was successful, but not that successful. <laughs> so I couldn't do that. So I just wanted some more space. I wanted space. I felt closed in. You know, I wanted to walk out my door and be alone <laughs> with the animals. And that's interesting, too, because Cape Elizabeth itself was historically a farming community. Yeah. And for a while, I lived out at Jordan Road there on the Sprague Estate. Um, I had horses, and I, and I lived in this little... I rented my house in suburbia and moved my kids to this farm so we could have the horses. And, 
yeah, that was really beautiful. I mean, that actually living out there made me realize, oh, okay, I, I need more space. I wasn't going to live out there. I couldn't have my own farm out there. So, yeah, have you ever been out there? Yes, it's yeah, beautiful. It's really beautiful. But you're right, there is a, a dichotomy between Cape Elizabeth, suburbia, and they have a wonderful school system. They obviously have Shore Road. I mean, it is a beautiful community, but the f- somehow the farming, agricultural aspect of it is separate, I yeah. think. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> and, and I would think less attainable for many people who right. haven't farmed there for generations. Right, it, yeah. You can have a farm passed down from your family. So now you're out in Hollis. And my understanding is that is that in addition to doing photography and having a farm, you also do some counseling. Yes, 10 years ago, I went, or maybe more now, I went back to school to get my master's in counseling psychology. Um, and because I... I found out that, I mean, I've always had horses and my kids were raised with horses and I understood the, just the value of being around an animal like that um, in in growing up and mentally. And then I I found out there was a program um, that taught equine assisted mental health. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, I already know about that, but I'm going to go back and get my master's and, and, and do that. So in writing, you have to write a thesis, which, as you know, it's horrible. I mean, <laughs> it was, I would thought about it the whole time. I thought, how am I going to do this? It's just not, I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. I'm not, it's not in the way my brain works. So I knew I had to develop something that I was really interested in, that I really was interested in researching, and otherwise it wasn't going to work. So I created a workshop called equine assisted photography therapy and i i had i held some of them you know i took a lot of photographs i to fill up a lot of those pages <laughs> and then i um wrote the you know graduated and all that but but the workshop turned out to be really great i've given it a lot of times i've given it out in colorado and you know yeah turned that turned out to be great Explore that a little bit for me. That's a, that's a lot of different elements to put into one very fascinating um, program. So um, photography therapy is an actual thing. I didn't really even realize that until. Um, but so how the workshop goes is um, we sort of think about what the issue is you're going to want to work on and um, take photographs. Um, sometimes you go out, we'll go out on the farm, and sometimes you know what that issue is you want to work on, but sometimes you don't know until you see visually see it, um, and you think, oh, yeah, that, that would be a good photograph to work on. And so you take these fo- this photograph, and then we talk about, you show the photograph and talk about, like, say it's a pile of wood, some wire, and really a messy situation, or a falling down fence, or, you know, we have a lot of those in a farm. And you say, you know, my life feels like this. It feels out of control. It's feeling messy and chaotic. And so then we take that. So sometimes you don't even know exactly how to voice that unless until you see it, until you're able to hold it and process it. So then we'll take that issue and go out and work with the horses with that specific and the whole equine that's a whole nother podcast I think but um and so then we do that do that therapy with the horses and then this is over several days and then come back and work on the photograph like changing it we have you know colors and sparkles or this or that or anything or just a pencil and and say clean it up a little what change the photograph to how you were feeling after the, this therapeutic and then talk about that and then show that. And yeah, that's how it works. So it's a visual, um, visual thing where you can, in, if you don't have the words, which right now I don't have the words, but you have the feeling and you can put it down 
like art. Does that make sense? It, it actually makes so much sense to me, really, because um, when I deal with patients in my family medicine practice, we do often get to a place where you can tell there's, there are really strong emotions around a subject. And sometimes words um, don't really capture those feelings very effectively. So I can imagine that working with an image or something external that, that kind of brings things to the surface a little bit more would be very powerful. Yes, that's, it is. And the, the equine work, I mean, 90% of communication is nonverbal. So that's, you know, where the equine work is very helpful because you're working with a big animal that's not really saying any words. And art's the same way, I think. I mean, sometimes it's just really hard to put into words how something is making you feel. So they go together. So I was able to combine my photography with my equine mental health work. Worked out. I mean, that's really powerful. I, I think there's a lot of, um, we spend a lot of time struggling with how to help people rewire things or reframe a narrative or do things that um, we don't necessarily feel like we have the tools to do, but what you're describing are actual tools that are very usable that can really have a positive outcome for people. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And it's fun, too. I mean, it's fun in a group. It's fun to, because we do it with, with phones, you know? I mean, when I, that wasn't, I started out doing it with little cameras, and I would teach, actually, photography, do photography therapy with kids at on a residential treatment center I used to work at. And we had to collect cameras. I put a big sign up at the Photoshop. Does anybody have cameras? You know, it was a whole thing. But, but now we just use the phones. And, and so it makes it fun because it's not like you have this big camera. And it's, I do photography workshops also, but this is different. It's not about, oh, we got to make a pretty photograph. It's just we, we, we want to photograph a feeling. So there isn't pressure about having it be, you know, art. And, but, then, but then they create the art around it. They color on it, and they turn something that was maybe had a negative feeling into something really beautiful, and then that feels good, of course. So There's a doctor that I work with, and she also has essentially a farm, and she re, uh, rehabilitates older horses. So she actually has a kind of a range of, she's always coming in and telling me about, you know, this older animal, or she has a dog that came in with a puppy and the dog has breast cancer, which I didn't realize was a thing in dogs. But, you know, she tells these stories about her animals. And, and this doctor is clearly wonderful also with people, but there's a richness to the conversation when she talks about her animals. And I always leave the conversations thinking like, there's a whole other story. There's a whole other world. She could be writing children's books. But even as you and I are talking, I mean, it's really not just children's books. I mean, this is a rich and powerful dialogue that I think um, does take place that we don't necessarily consider. Yeah. The, the animals, I mean, you know, they speak volumes without speaking at all. Yeah. Well, I would say my little dogs, I, I feel that way. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the neighbors over here me talking to them and probably wonder exactly what's going on, but I'm all right with that. I'm comfortable. And I think that's why when I look at your work that I, um, I do think it evokes this, these feelings that maybe we don't have the opportunity to tap into as often. I mean, there is something that in some cases deeply peaceful about some of the images that you shoot. Yes, I'm usually going for peaceful. <laughs> you know, even the the sheep in the running towards me in the fall when their wool is long and they're you know like the dog is hurting them. This is even of course the photograph is stopping it, so it seems it's just you know you're not hearing those hoofs and hearing that hearing me yelling at the dog to <laughs> down. But um, even that's peaceful to me. I mean, when it's, when it's going on, and especially when I've stopped it and I'm staring at it, 
And I'm like, oh man, this is, this, this whole sort of thing that may seem chaotic if you were watching it is I'm stopping it in a peaceful moment. This is the moment, this is why I do it, because this makes me feel this certain way. But just to stop it and have someone else look at it and go, wow, that's, yeah, so there is this peace within this chaos with the sheep. Do you think that that's something that people are looking for in this kind of crazy, chaotic, challenging world that we live in now? Is that opportunity to go back and, and have some sense of peace amidst more of a natural chaos, perhaps? No, oh, definitely. I mean, for me anyway. And, and yeah, I think when you, you know, it's like when you look at the Wyeth paintings of the animals in the barn, or that that pig, you know, or that with the light in the barn. And that is, that, and I like to have this in my photographs also, where it could be 200 years ago. It could be at, at any time. You can't tell that you're in this time. You can't tell that the chaos that's going on in the world, or you, it could be anything. I mean, think of the chaos that went on 200 years ago, <laughs> trying to survive. But when it comes to the barn and the and the animals, they're the same. They're just the same. And my breed of sheep, it's a it's a heritage breed, so it's um, they've been the same for a very long time. And it's a it's a rare breed um, because the wool is kind of a rug wool. You know, now the wool very fine. I have a couple of cormos, which is fine wool, and those sheep are those lammies are half cormo. Um, but yeah, I like that feel. That's a peacefulness of not being able to tell when it was, except that it's a photograph. <laughs> I'm thinking about some of your photographs and, and the sheep, and there's an interesting texture to them. They're not these classical sheep that you think of with, you know, the bright white wool. And I mean, they, they're kind of rough and ready. They look like they could, I don't know, they canter out of the Scottish countryside or something. I don't, I don't know if sheep canter. I think that's horses, but um, I don't know what sheep do exactly when they're running, but they're that, that textural element to them is appealing in an interesting way. Yes. I, that's, I'm, usually trying to go for that in my photographs to show that texture of their wool. It's, it's amazing to me how beautiful that is. And I, when the light is right and you can, it, it's not, so you think of like, if you're going to draw a sheep, it'd be this fuzzy, it'd be this round white ball. Right. And so to, to just show that texture of their wool and that's the wool of the Scotties that is, it's long, and it's wiggly, and it's, that's amazing to me. So when the light is right, and you can show the depth of that, their wool, and, and also their, their horns have these lines on them, that's very, a lot of texture, and then their faces, I mean, you know, it's just, I'm obviously obsessed with photographing my sheep. <laughs> that's a good thing, though. Yeah, well, I, I, the conversation I had with uh, Martha Berker about her art and her conversation with me about flowers, for example, I feel the same way. I mean, I don't have sheep. I have small dogs. My small dogs, I actually find them quite fascinating in the fact that one of them, her fur grows a certain way and it's this bright red kind of ready to take on the world, fierce little lady that she is. The other one is this dark lord, you know, he has this just smooth, dark fur. And then I think of the flowers and the flowers that grow in these various patterns. And it's amazing to me that nature creates these things. And I just want to say, how is it that we have this growing all around us from a little tiny seed or a little tiny bit of life that starts up? Yeah. And that's what I'm thinking of when you're talking to me. Yeah, the flowers are pretty amazing. The, the, I, I mean, when I stare at a flower and I stare at it, I think, how, what, what? How did that ever happen? Spirals and spirals and spirals and, yeah. I've photographed a lot of flowers, actually, too, right? Close up, 
right? And I'm like sort of George O'Keefe sensuality, like, wow, this is just, this is just crazy. There's so many things that when you go down, 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 down to the tiniest little thing, it's like when you're flying and you're looking down at the earth, the whole earth looks in, in so many places just like that tiny little space in the flower, you know? That just fascinates me. It's all connected like that. So it's good that there are people like us in the world that understand this about one another. So, I mean, I, I don't think that it's an unusual feeling, but I don't think it's a feeling that people necessarily talk about just to say, flowers are really amazing. Our sheep are really textured or complex. But it, but it is so. I mean, there's something very real about it. Well, that's, what's, that's why I photograph and show people. Look at this. Look at this. Yeah. And people, you know, sheep, I used to photograph horses, like I said before, and they're beautiful. They're classic. I mean, they're, you know, and you, I would go on these trips and make the horses look as beautiful as possible, which is not hard because they're so beautiful, but they do have to be in a certain way. And, and when they're running, it's really gorgeous. And the mane is flying and all that and horses. And uh, the sh so people have seen that. They, I mean, they know that. They're like, wow, that's a powerful animal, you know. But to look at a sheep and go, wow, that's how beautiful is that? That's a little more unusual, <laughs> I think. But, you know, yeah, I love the sheep. You've had different phases in your life, which you kind of alluded to earlier. I mean, obviously, you started out in New York, ended up in Maine. But along the way, you've got, kind of gathered a degree here, an experience there, which I think is really interesting. Some people, they stay on one straight path and they're there from beginning to end and they're happy with that and that's good. Um, you started out as a painter when you were I, at art school. I painted in art school um, and I, I graduated from George Washington. I went to Silvermine College of Art, which I was listening to one of the podcasts. Jean Jack, I think, had a show at Silvermine College of Art. I like that they said the famed Silvermine College of Art. <laughs> um, and then from there, I went to George Washington University, and I st and studied at the Corcoran, and I studied printmaking, lithographs, and but I at Silvermine I started t studying photography because we took everything painting, photography, sculpture, you know how you do that. And the photography teacher was a guy named John Cohen, and he 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 was he was just so amazing. It John uh, some people just did a documentary on John Cohen. He's died recently. Sorry. But um, he was he, he was an artist, obviously, and a photographer, and a documentary filmmaker, and a musician. Um, and he, like, he photographed, he was the part of the whole Beat Generation thing. He photographed all those guys and um, hung out with all those guys, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and all those Burroughs, you know. <laughs> and so I was in school with him. And then and I was 19 and my father died. And I was, that was in the summer. And so everything just dried up like <clears throat> when that happened. And my mother was like, well, I don't know, you got to go get a job now and you can't go to school anymore. And so um, I went to Silvermine and tried to get a scholarship and I brought all my work my paintings, which weren't very good, and my <laughs> some things. And the dean, Dean Gray, just, no, you're not. So, I, so, I, so I'm at home feeling pretty bad, you know. Dad died, and then I wasn't in school, and I'm just sitting around. And um, it's about three weeks into class, and Cohen said to a friend of mine, where's Nina? And the friend said, oh, she tried to get a scholarship, but she couldn't get it. So he went to the dean, and he said, oh, but don't cry. I think I'm going to cry saying this. But <laughs> he said, if anybody does anything with photography, it's going to be Nina Fuller. So call her up and get her back here. So three weeks into the, the phone rings, and it was Dean Gray saying, okay, come back. So, yeah, I owe a lot to John Cohen. I mean, that's, a, that's just a fantastic story. And the fact that you had somebody who was willing to 
really be your advocate in a huge way. Yeah. I mean, he literally changed the course of your life. Yeah. Yeah. That was amazing. And when they did the documentary on him, um, this film crew came from France and came to the farm and stayed there and, and uh, for a couple of days filming me because I knew him in school, I guess to represent his teaching part of it. And it was actually, they were packed up. This seems crazy because that's such a, you know, I mean, John Cohen and, <laughs> but they were packed up and I started telling that story and they're like, oh my gosh. And I remember getting all their stuff undone and going back out to the barn and, um, but it did end up on the cutting room floor, but in the CD of this film, which is now in all the festivals and getting a lot of, um, it's the extra, you know, they have the extra, <laughs> I mean, the extra, Yeah. Well, sometimes it's good to be extra. Yeah, I'm extra. <laughs> but I, 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 as I'm listening to this, it just reminds me that you can go into something and think that you've got an idea of what you want to do, say be a painter. But maybe that's not really what's meant to happen. Maybe there's something else going on out there that there's some other path that you're going to end up following and there's just no way to know unless you kind of trust. Yeah, and... and and I think not making really firm plans about anything is, is important so that you can flow. But photography, I mean, ever since I was a little kid, I had a camera. And I photographed everything. I see pictures that I took when I was 10 of, like, the horses and the dog, a lot of pictures of my dog. <laughs> you know, and I had them in little albums. And I just never, I don't think, you know, that I ever thought that you could actually make a living taking pictures. I just just taking pictures, but I always liked taking pictures. So, and I always had a little camera. And so when I got to Silvermine, um, and it was like a class in photography, um, and then I met John Cohen, and I'm like, oh, cool. This is, this is perfect, because this is what I have always liked to do, is take pictures. So I had a little light, darkroom, chemical-y thing when I was a little kid, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's always been there. As we talk about kind of different iterations of your life, you're now allowing people to create an, a writer's retreat on your farm, yeah. which, I mean, it, it's just the, when I think about the sheep that you photograph and the texture of their wool, it, it translates into, for me, this almost a blanket of your life that you've woven. And here's another kind of a... A set of threads that are weaving into your life with this writer's retreat? Well, there's so many things. I really don't want to miss anything. And there's so many things, which is why I went back to school. I mean, I was 60-something when I went back to school, and it was hard because <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't, you know, ugh. it was really, ugh. it was so exact with where you had to put the dot you know, what? Who cares, really, where the, you know, when you're doing the references, whatever. I, I mean, that is not the way my brain works. I mean, works. like APA formatting for your the, the bibliographer, bibliography. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can relate to this. That yes. was like actually the hardest part. I know. <laughs> I'm like, really? Who cares? Yes, I, I'm very familiar with this. Yeah. Exactly. I would have to redo it and redo it and redo it. And apparently somebody really cared. I'm like, really? Is this, isn't like just helping people the, the most important part? No, that dot. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but um, it was fascinating to me that, that, like, that type of therapy existed, so I wanted to learn about it, you know. It's writers coming to a beautiful spot, you know. I have a, I have a beautiful farm, and when people come there, I don't think it's just me. They say, wow, this is it's just a f different feeling. And we walk in the woods. I have a grateful string that hangs, a, a braided um, rope that hangs from a tree. And we, every time, I mean, I go there three or four times a day to the bench. I have a bench in the back. And when anybody comes to the farm, we go to the bench. And I take a picture of us on the bench. <laughs> and, and I have this whole, the Blue Bench Project, it's called, of people sitting at the bench. I mean, people, and I have a couple, couple of Airbnbs. So people show up at the Airbnbs and go, can we go to the bench? You know, <laughs> like, so anyway, but the grateful string, we just stop 
and we say what we're grateful for. And it's just, yeah, it's great. It's a good thing. So there's a lot of different elements to that farm, to my life. Oh, I think you said it well, and you said, I, I don't want to miss anything. Right. <laughs> there's just a lot of world out there to experience, so why limit yourself? Right. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation. So have I. Thank you. I've learned a lot about you. I'm sure there's much, much more that we could talk about because clearly there's just a richness to the life that you have lived. And I appreciate your willingness to come in and talk with me today. Thank you. This was fun. I've been speaking with artist and photographer and writer and farmer and counselor and so many more things, Nina Fuller. You can learn more about Nina um, through the Portland Art Gallery. You can see her work at the Portland Art Gallery. You can visit their website. Maybe, I don't know, you want to take a class with her. Or you could go do her Airbnb. So many things. Nina is so many things. And it's been my pleasure to talk with her today on Radio Maine. Thank you, Nina. Thank you.